finally we get you on Real Vision. I've been on on uh, your podcast uh, and your YouTube channel, but finally I got you on your Real Vision. So good to be here with you. You're in where? I'm down in Tasmania, which is a nice place to be at the moment, Raul. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, great. Um, tell people a little bit about your background, just so they know who you are, what you do, and even how you got into the, the kind of crypto space. And then we'll talk a bit more after that. For sure. So I'm actually a pharmacist by trade who is always very interested in the world of finance and investing and lost a lot of money in the GFC when my parents gave me some shares for my 21st birthday, which shows my age a little bit. And I continued to go down that rabbit hole and I just love the world of um, options and derivatives and black shoals because I had a science and mathematics background and interests. And then I became a bit of a gold and silver bug after the GFC when you watch all those documentaries and try and find out what happened and how no one can possibly see this coming. And that led me to find Bitcoin in 2012. And I fell down that rabbit hole in an even bigger way and committed a lot of time to that. Uh, and then in 2015, 16, Ethereum came along and that sort of expanded the horizons and just, wow, this this technology is honestly going to change the world and annoying all my friends and family with that. And then in 2017, I finally quit pharmacy altogether and went full-time educating people on crypto. And we've now got around 200,000 followers, um, you know, a lot of free content, some premium research, and we try and keep people up to date with everything that's happening in that world. And that's Nugget News, right? Yeah, Nuggets News, yes. So... Listen, obviously, the whole crypto world is about change anyway. And I've, you know, bored at nauseam our audience about the, the future financial system. But over this whole COVID period and coming out the other side, I kind of feel like everything has changed in the space too. So it started off without me, because you're much closer and deeper into the space. I'm macro, so I look very top down. The first thing I notice is that Ethereum starts to do a lot better than Bitcoin. What was that all about? And how did you start figuring out what was going on? Because what's gone on from that when it started a few months ago to here has been unbelievable. I think it's all relative because Bitcoiners could argue that um, Ethereum underperformed Bitcoin for a couple of years and it's having its time now. So Ethereum's had a lot of setbacks along its journey of where it wanted to be. Uh, and it's kind of ebbs and flows between being behind on that timeline and then being really exciting and very promising again. And we're in one of those stages where everything looks really good and set to upgrade. And the previous boom was all about the ICOs and that mania. And I think this boom is more real in terms of finance and lending. And we are now doing things which you can't do in the traditional finance world. That's attracted a lot of capital, very high yields, and things that we didn't really expect to, to take the lead here, like stable coins, you know, that market cap was around a billion dollars and mainly just Tether, which was a very shadowy area. And that's now $10, 12000000000 billion. Yeah. So I want to break these two things down for people who aren't so familiar, because a lot of people have come in on their Bitcoin journey and they're like, OK, I hear about Ethereum. What is it? Is it different? Is it the same? Is it not? It's not a hard currency. What is it? So. We need to go through that first, then we'll go through stable coins as well, just so people kind of get an understanding of what this is and why it's a bit different. Yeah, so people hopefully have a very good understanding of Bitcoin and that idea of being scarce and a digital currency. Ethereum is slightly different in that it's trying to be a platform or it's more of a technology play in the way that I see it. So it certainly has some monetary aspects and they're trying to change their monetary policy in some way to be a, a hard currency and, and be scarce and finite. So that's one important aspect. But the main play here is that they're trying to rebuild a ledger or a platform or a protocol where anyone can build on top of it freely. So just like Bitcoin is trying to build a new financial system where I can send money to- Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1 to get a month's access to this incredible treasure trove. I don't think you can afford to be without it. To Raul freely anywhere in the world. And we don't have to worry about banks or being censored or anything like that. Ethereum is trying to create a new internet, Web3, you might have heard this called. 
where anyone can build an application and all of a sudden Twitter can't take down you know, Trump's tweet or YouTube can't take down my video because I said the word COVID in it. So they're trying to build this censorship resistant protocol for the flow of data or information where anyone can build an app on top of it, a website. So it's a, a very much a technology play. So this is not necessarily just about, we'll come on to the money aspects later, but this is not necessarily about money. This is a whole protocol platform technology for anything that needs to be recorded or, you know, in some sort of ledger, whether it's information, whether it's money or whether it's assets or whether it's, is that right? Yeah, well, I think people might have heard this term smart contract, and it's kind of funny because I think of it as a, a dumb program. So it allows you to do a few more things than what Bitcoin can do. So rather than just send money from A to B, you can program in, you know, characteristics or, or traits. And that the first, I guess, application of that was the ICO mania. And being able to raise capital from anywhere in the world was a very cool concept. Now, the second iteration of that was stable coins in this world of De DeFi, so decentralized finance and, and lending. So anything is possible. And the next things that we might get to in future episodes or whatnot, are, you know, gaming, and there's all sorts of things. You can build anything on Ethereum like you can build anything on the internet. So at the moment, the things that are being disrupted are probably those things that are, are ripe for disruption. You know, the world of finance, being able to get a loan and the rates and everything that we see, it's really out of whack. So there's this new Cambrian explosion. It's just like this free market capitalism. And who would have thought that a boring old stable coin in a world of volatility and huge run-ups in price would be the thing that is so popular? And just tying this all together... 12, 18 months ago, the central banks basically said that crypto is too small to even acknowledge and it's not going to affect monetary policy. Here we are 18 months later with every central bank, government, even the commercial banks, you know, J Jamie Dimon wants JP coin. So everyone is talking about this stable coin. So talk to people who aren't familiar with stable coin because we've got a very split audience. Some people are deep down the rabbit hole and others don't really know. So what is a stable coin and why have we got them? Because when I first saw them, I'm like, I don't really get this. It just feels like money laundering via Tether. And now it's become actually a payment rails and all sorts of stuff. Explain, explain stable coin now, and then we'll talk a bit about where it's going. So a stable coin, there's a few different uh, iterations of this, but the most common ones that you hear about, like Tether or USDC, um, are basically we have a digital version of a dollar and it becomes a token. And in a bank somewhere, we have a dollar that is backing that up one to one. So Tether's always in the news and it's a little bit shady because they've got banking relationships all around the world. And over the years, they haven't been able to find good banking partners. So it's very hard for them to, I guess, be transparent about that dollar for dollar backing. Whereas now we have things that are highly regulated like USDC or the Gemini, the, you know, the Winklevoss twins have got the Gemini US dollar. So that is all very transparent and highly regulated. And it's just a one for one peg and they give you a digital dollar. Now, once you've got that digital dollar in your hands, you can use that on any crypto app and anywhere on Ethereum. And I can send it to Raul, I can send it to anyone in anywhere in the world through my, my app. And that is far a superior system to being able to send a dollar to you anywhere in the world through the legacy financial system. That's basically impossible to do. So how fast is it? So if I send you a dollar via Tether, Oh, not Tether, that's whatever, it, whichever one it is, whichever stable coin, how fast do you get it? Because right now, if I'm to send, if you say, hey, Rail, send me $10 for something, and I go to log on to my bank account, I put in the thing, put in the transfer, they have to confirm the payment, usually the next day because of the Cayman Islands, then it goes, it's three days in the middle of nowhere, going through the SWIFT payment system, then it goes through your sorting, then it goes to you, and it's like, if you're lucky, you'll get it in three days. It, well, if you're very lucky, you get it in a day, if you're normal, it's three days and sometimes up to five. How does this work? Absolutely. So th this is one of the things that sent me down the rabbit hole to Bitcoin because when I'd been traveling the world, it, it cost $50 and the, the spreads were 10 to 20% depending on the uh, country you were going to and the currency you needed. And with Bitcoin, you know, it's a 10 minute block time and most exchanges will let your um, deposit show up after two confirmations. So if the blockchain is not too busy, then you'll get it in 20 minutes. Whereas if it's very, very busy on Bitcoin and there's lots of transactions waiting to get in those blocks, you might be waiting an hour or so. Whereas Ethereum is slightly different. It has block times of around 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, and some exchanges will want to wait for 
you know, it, it varies. Let's let's say 10, 10 of those, 20 of those. So it might be a few minutes for an exchange to confirm that that transaction is there. But if I'm just sending it to you directly and you trust me, it'll basically show up within 10 seconds. And you can say, I know Alex, I trust Alex, it's there. Now, that's when the network is chugging along nicely. At the moment, it's just been horribly congested because of how popular it has become. So the big battle for Bitcoin, but particularly Ethereum at the moment, is how do we scale this? So some people at the moment are paying fees of $20. Now, obviously, you can't send me a dollar if, and pay $20 of fees. Well, you can if you want, but it's not very efficient. So where we're at now is there's a lot of technologies that are either layer one on Ethereum itself or layer two, uh, a little bit like how uh, Bitcoin has its lightning network. So there's layers on top of Ethereum, and some of these are now production ready. And if you wanted to right now, I could send you some Ethereum over a layer two solution, and that would be instant and cost a hundredth of a cent, for example. So that's kind of where we're at. And what's the compromise for doing that then? Because if you're not uh, on the main network, what's the compromise of doing on a second layer? So there's about a dozen different scaling solutions, and all of them have different trade-offs. Now, some people say that Obviously, you don't have the security of the whole blockchain and all the nodes. Um, and in the Bitcoin world and Ethereum world at the moment, it's proof of work where every node confirms every transaction. So in some solutions, you're kind of giving your trust to that, that other company. But they also have to, without getting too technical, you can always challenge things and say, report back to the blockchain from the layer two, back to that the original Ethereum chain and say, hey, is that right? Is that guy ripping me off? And they can say, yeah, no, that's right. We will validate that. So there's different trade-offs about speed, security, decentralization, um, and that's, I guess, the experimentation. So they're doing, they're basically batching stuff and then putting it back onto the main chain. Is that right? Oh, uh, batching is one of the scaling techniques, yeah. And others are doing like channels, like the Lightning Network style. Um, others are having a separate blockchain off to the side and saying, hey, we, we trust you guys, that company. Um, it might be a company or a project, but there might still be 100 nodes, but that's obviously a lot better than 10,000 nodes doing Bitcoin or Ethereum at the moment. So they're all the, the little trade-offs and experimentation that's happening at the moment. And so why the explosion of stable coins? Who's using it? What's its uses? What, what the hell's going on? Because this has gone from a small-ish a small -ish market, and it's like it's gone exponential. I think uh, you did a really interesting interview with... Um, uh, Crypto Hayes from from Bitmex, and he was talking about the fact that the collateral in that world, and they, they were the number one exchange for a very long time, is Bitcoin. So in the world of trading and speculation, a lot of the time, the assets that were collateral and underpinning this were, were Bitcoin or Ethereum, and they're very volatile. So all of a sudden, we can now have uh, stable coins. I'm, I'm not going to go off on the other the tangent. We might get to that in the future. But basically, we have a stable collateral. And that's a bit of a game changer when you consider the volatility of the, the old assets that we used to have to use. But it's kind of weird that you have to use the US dollar as your collateral for crypto, right? It's kind of an I imperfect world. It, it's better than something that falls 94%, like Ethereum did in the bear market, when you're trying to build a project or make a bet or something like that. But I think it also just comes back to the fact that traditional finance has just bit, not served so many people. And if you can say to someone anywhere on the planet, rather than your hyperinflating currency, you can now save in US dollars, it gets very, very interesting. And this is where I sort of have gone down rabbit holes with you and Brent Johnson and others talking about what's going on with the US dollar at the moment and the euro dollar system and Brent's um, milkshake theory and saying, well, if every person on the planet has a smartphone and they now have a digital rail via Ethereum to get a, a dollar, a US dollar, that completely throws everything on its head in terms of, well, the Fed need to do a swap line to this country. And you know, the RBA are trying to get some more dollars from this other um, you know, central bank, this, that, and the other, and the commercial banking system being too afraid to lend to each other through the repo markets. Now every person on the planet can get a digital dollar over Ethereum. That's very, that's a game changer. So what happens in countries where there's kind of capital restrictions, let's say Turkey or wherever it is? I mean, there's tons of them, South Africa. Does this get around that? Is this the best way of getting around capital restrictions? So in those countries, we, you know, we get mixed data. Some people say that the uh, adoption of Bitcoin is very high in those countries. Other people say that the adoption of stable coins is very high. To, to these people, Bitcoin is interesting, but it still has the volatility. Like to them, the US dollar is almost like gold in these countries yeah. where the currency is just hyperinflating. So 
I think we are going to see a huge demand, and we already are. But the question becomes, how does the government's control and censor and regulate the on and off ramps? That's basically the way that they can shut it down. So when people say they'll never let this happen, for example, well, you, you can't ever stop it because it's just the internet. And as, even if they shut down the internet, people have satellite connections. So any time that someone can get online and has a digital device, they have access to Ethereum or Bitcoin, this this web, this blockchain that exists everywhere in the in the ether. Uh, pardon the pun, but um. I, I think the only way that they can regulate is those on-ramps and off-ramps. And then you say, well, even if they don't allow any business to serve the banking system and for people to get money into Ethereum or stable coins, well, then we have these local peer-to-peer -peer markets spring up. And it's like a sort of a gray market, a black market. So someone says, you know, I know I know Raul, um, I, you know, you go there, if you've got the cash or he's got a banking relationship in um, and Panama, whatever it is. So there's always kind of a, a, a route in somewhere, a way to work around it. And it's just, well, they can slow it down, they can add friction, but sometimes that actually creates a premium rather than making it harder to get, yeah. Yeah, because we saw, you know, we've seen in various countries, even India, you know, cryptos traded a premium just because of capital restrictions and stuff like that. And so there's a huge demand for it. Yeah. So the private sector's kind of jumped the gun on the, on the central bank digital currencies, no? Absolutely. So Libra was the one that everyone heard about. And that, Which in was a lot a of ways, currency. yeah. So I, I think that's where they kind of messed up. If they had have said that they're just doing a stable coin, a US dollar stable coin, that's not that, not that much different to the Gemini dollar or, or Tether or USDC. So the fact that they basically went after everyone's currencies, you know, you're really treading on some toes when you say that, and you're going to choose the winners. Well, Euro, we're only going to have you as 10%. Yuan, we're only going to have you as 15%. So you're never going to keep everyone happy. You're treading on everyone's toes, and it's no wonder that that got shut down. So look, I've heard that they're going to go back to maybe just a US dollar thing or maybe just the currency of the country they're in. I'm not really sure, but really... They've got the billions of users, but I think that the leaders are already the DeFi's of the world that have gone from a billion to over 10 billion in a year. And I know we sort of had a bit of an exchange on Twitter and you were saying that this is pretty insignificant in terms of global Forex numbers. But what we're seeing in like 24-hour daily trade volumes is already more than the entire market cap. So the velocity of money in this world, a recent report showed that stable coins are about 20, whereas you know the velocity of M2 in the US economy is dropping and it's nearly at one. So this world is just absolutely but, exploding. So again, and who, changing. I mean, who's using it? I mean, I've not used it yet. I've not needed to, but I understand the benefits. I've just kind of not got round to it yet because it's so painful transferring money out of my Cayman Islands bank account where I live into my bloody crypto account. I don't like holding money in my, in, you know, third party wallets. And then I have to keep it in my other wallet and then I have to plug it into my computer. And it's just all of a bit of a pain still, but who's See, using it? Somebody's using a lot of it and rapidly, or is it just the internal system of all the crypto businesses and everybody else transferring money around the system? There is a lot of growth and a lot of demand from just traders and speculators and, and, and hedges in this world. But I would also argue with what you just said, I would, I'd love to sit down with you for five minutes and show you because that should not be the way that you're thinking about it. It should be that much easier than anything else. And you should be able to have those stable coins in your own custody and not worry about someone else or plugging in a wallet. So I've got stuff on you know phones as well as the cold storage for higher amounts, but it should be easy like a click of a button to send anyone in the world stable coins and as a side thing i mean one of the, the the horrible thing is and this is a psychological thing because new technology you need to get over the fact that the risk of transfer is yours so if i send you money i don't care if i send you ten dollars if i send you a hundred grand that i put in your wrong address i'm fucked it's gone there and are terrifying yes so there are new ways around this that are projects and apps that are almost helping you create a backup or passwords or layers of protection as well. So we want to solve those problems because we know that that is the case. And you shouldn't have 100 grand on a mobile app. You should have your you know, $100 so you can send me $10. But at the same time, we've got uh, business partners and relations around the world with our, with our um, business and everything we do. And we've honestly convinced our partners to start using stable coins because someone in Canada, for example, let's say has to pay us $30,000 for something we've done website for them. We said to them, we, you know, we don't want that 10% spread. We don't want to pay these high exchange rate fees every month. 
and we taught them how to use stable coins. And now they pay us $30,000 a month in USDC stable coin. And the fee is 10 cents on Ethereum. So these are the people that we're educating. And this is just a better system. So it's honestly, in my mind, it is only a matter of time and education until that traditional payment system becomes irrelevant. And yes, we've seen Venmos of the world and PayPals and so the, there's the sort of layers, but all those middlemen, um, the physical location, this is what blockchain does. It cuts out all of that unnecessary middlemen and it goes peer to peer. And that is what I think money is going to become. Talk me through, and again, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, but some people will say, well, you've just mentioned PayPal. What What's the difference? Well, I think PayPal still has a uh, higher higher fees and, you know, censorship. They can shut down my account if they see a transaction that has the word crypto in it. You know, PayPal have literally done that to me over the years already. So it's just the same as Bitcoin. It's like, well, people say, well, the, the you know, Visa and MasterCard system is pretty good in America or Australia. And that's, that's very true. But there's also 170 other countries that are poorly, poorly served by their financial system. And that's where the stablecoin system is far better. Yeah, and also I guess the key point is it's decentralized. So nobody can tell you that you can't do that or, you know, all of that stuff, whatever it is. And and again, it's not for nefarious means, but as you said, you know, even we, you know, we have problems with bloody crypto content on YouTube, let alone payments and stuff. Well, let's let's just say that we have a one of our first products was a nine dollar newsletter. Someone in Russia can't really subscribe and pay nine dollars a month through the traditional banking system. What if there's a, a teenage girl in Africa and she wants to write about the suppression of that country that she's in and the cartels and, and she starts a blog and I can donate $1 to her and that can be a life-changing amount of money if 10 or 20 people are donating that to her and none of that is possible through the legacy financial system. So it incorporates billions of people in India and these emerging economies into the world of e-commerce and they can start an online business on Ethereum and none of that is possible. They can't get banked there's literally not a bank in their country. And the good thing is, is they don't even need to know it's on Ethereum. It's like, we don't really need to know what protocol we're operating this Skype call with. It's irrelevant. The that fact is, exactly, is, is, I'm just talking to you in video and that's it. That's exactly where it's all going. And when I said to you before about, am I using the Lightning Network or am I using Loopring as a layer two? You don't care. You don't need to know what's happening behind that screen when you click press Alex, send Alex a dollar and it says the fee is one one hundredth of a cent. No, exactly. I don't even know what my processor is. I don't know anything. I, I know I've got an Apple Mac and that's about all I know. And that's, you know, exactly. that's top level branding and that's it. And that's where this is all going. So whether you're playing games, sending stable coins, uh, borrowing loans, I don't know if you want to get into some of the, the virtual world where you'll go into a, a virtual reality and go to a virtual bank to get a virtual Ethereum loan soon. So this is where it's all going. So what does that talk, talk me through that world. That sounds interesting. So I know you've spoken to Barry Silbert um, and others about Decentraland. Decentraland, yeah. So this is there's a few of and, these that you know, are pop Minecraft and all these places have been using tokens and digital assets for a long time. Yeah, so that digital gold or digital currencies and in-game items are very familiar for all these gamers. But now these things are on a, on a blockchain so they can take an item from one world to another or they can take their uh, in-game experience or anything, and that becomes um, a, a token and it has value, it has value to them, but it has an open marketplace where anyone can buy anything of someone else. And what we're actually seeing in some of these countries you mentioned, like like Turkey, and that some of these games are actually the, the best payment rails or means for people to explain, you know, exchange value or set up digital businesses. So it's a little bit hard for people to understand, but in Decentraland and other um, similar virtual environments, we're about to set up like a Nuggets News headquarters and we'll have virtual meetups there where people from around the world will come and get together and we might have our Christmas party there. Barry Silver and the guys at Grayscale, I might give away some alpha here. I think they're setting up a, a, big, uh, a big camp in Decentraland as well and they will have their investor conferences in Decentraland from now on. So you can either go there and attend it just watching the screen like you and I are or you, in the future you'll be able to put on the headset and you'll be in full virtual reality. Uh, and this is where people will conduct business meetings and so on. And if we have this backdrop of COVID, people are working from home, people can't get together in huge numbers. I propose to the guys at Decentraland, you should be going to the NBA right now. Um, you know, the Australian Aussie yeah. Rules Grand Final, we can't have 100,000 people in this big stadium. Instead of selling 100,000 tickets and having it limited, 
we can sell a million tickets and everyone has the best seat in the house because everyone's got their VR goggles on and they can choose where they I want mean, to sit. And you've seen that in some of the other games. I don't know which one it was. I think it was Minecraft. No, it was um, oh, Fortnite. Whichever. or Fortnite. DJs and live music. And you buy your ticket, you go along, you can meet people who sit next to you. You've got the whole experience and it's a real live set by whoever's doing it. I think Lady Gargoyle's done one. A bunch of people have done them and they've been massive and they've sold a ton of tickets. So people are now viewing that world as as very real and they're tokenizing everything from the music to the artwork to the, the land. And now we take this a step further and we go back to the world of DeFi. All of this is built on Ethereum to these Ethereum protocol standards. And now I can say, well, that song that I wrote was a, a smash hit and the rights for that on Ethereum are now worth $100,000 a year. Lady Gaga can use the rights for that song as collateral in DeFi to go and get a loan and borrow against. Or someone can create some artwork. And we've seen some of the leading artists now building these DeFi artworks. So you might have heard NFTs, non-fungible tokens. That can be anything from a deed to a house to a song to an actual gaming sword. And so, all, all right, so now we're moving into DeFi, which is where we were headed. Okay, well, talk me through all of this. So, so what you're doing is you're taking digital value from elsewhere and then using it now within the financial system. So you're actually realizing the value in different ways. So if I go into a bank right now to get a loan, they're going to have a look at my credit score. And if I open a leveraged trading account at a broker, they're going to say, what assets do you have as collateral if things go south? It's a very similar concept, except for this is all verifiable, all on chain, all on Ethereum. And they can say, well, Alex has that house in Decentraland. We know he's got some, some Bitcoin. We know he's got some stable coins. Um, and they can sort of say, well, this is the digital value or how much we're willing to lend it, uh, you. And the other thing that we're now seeing is credit scores. So a, a project called uh, Aave, which are building on Ethereum, they recently got a financial services license in, in, um, in Europe. And that is a big deal. So now we can start to build credit scores because at the moment, most things are over collateralized or I've got to have some assets backing up to get loans because you can, you know, I'm not going to lend a, a random person on the internet a lot of money. You know, they're going to go off with it. So what we're now transitioning to is from over collateralized or fully collateralized to genuine loans and trust scores. And so I can build a digital reputation um, and this is sort of the merging of the two worlds, DeFi and traditional finance. And this is where it gets very, very exciting. Um, it ties in everything. So I can have NFTs as collateral and tokens. Um, I can use my stable coins. Maybe I want to use some tokenized gold. So recently in Decentraland, they had a soccer tournament and the winners got a gold trophy, but the gold trophy was minted from real digital gold tokens. So this is just like everything. This it came in explosion. So they're the, everything the Paxos tokens. ones or whatever, which are backed by gold. Similar, yeah, similar. So it's a gold trophy that has the value of gold, but it's digital. Yeah, and, tradable. and if you if you win and you say, you know what, I don't really like a gold trophy, I can go to Ethereum, go to a protocol, and melt that down, and click a button, and it gives me back. 20 grams of gold tokens. I can go sell those on the market if I don't like the gold trophy. So everything is tokenized and the possibilities are mind blowing once you start to think about all this. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to understand. I mean, it's moving so fast and people are just really doing testers. I mean, we're nowhere in the journey. There's, there's just so many tests. So it's the bit DeFi thing I want to really dig into now because, so we had a crypto market, started with Bitcoin. Bitcoin was a currency originally as an idea. I'm not entirely sure it's a currency. I'm kind of more thinking it's a reserve asset or a store of wealth of some sort. And we'll talk a bit about this, that reserve asset idea that I've been talking about, a uh, collateral. But then we start creating all the other cryptos and the tokens and other stuff. And from it, out pops a money market, which is a lending market, right? So for, for this financial system, my, my, my viewpoint for this financial system to take real hold is you need a time value of money mm. because that's how the world works. If I'm going to lend you money for 10 years, I need to get paid a rate of interest for it. The world has always worked that way. And however the interest gets paid, whether it's in you know, streaming uh, returns or whatever it is, doesn't matter. I want some something in exchange. You might give me some tokens instead of something else. But this DeFi revolution that's going on and I want to talk through all the foods because I don't understand any of them. 
this is the short term money market trying to be established where mm -hmm. we've got a lending market going on. Talk me through just at top level what that is, what's going on, and then we'll dig into some of the projects. So as you say, there's yeah, there's a high demand at the moment and the the high interest rates available were sort of floating around the five to twenty five percent mark. And some that's of that is a, a bit of a that's a that's a year or a month or a that's that's annual annual yield, sorry, yeah. And now that was a, a basically a function of supply and demand and a little bit of risk. And now we get into these layers upon layers of risk where people say, well, I'm going to go and deposit in this other contract. So, sorry, just to back up one sec, who's borrowing this stuff? You've got your Ethereum. You want to lend it out. Who, who's borrowing it? So some traders are borrowing this, um, some projects that need liquidity for their, well, the two things that have really exploded are the DEXs, so the decentralized exchange where any person can swap any any token with another token with anyone else. And what they basically created there was this um, automated market makers where anyone can become a market maker and rather than having to do it on exchange, anyone can contribute any amount of liquidity, big or small. So all of a sudden everyone's pulling their tokens in and saying, yes, I'm happy to lend those out or add liquidity to earn some fees. And where the protocols are trying to attract everyone is offering them a token. So they're saying, Raul, if you come and offer your Ethereum and some stable coin as a pair and add liquidity, we'll give you some Nuggets News um, coin, which is like the governance token, like almost like shares in this protocol. And that gives you a right to all the fees for everyone that's exchanging value and now just recently some of these like uniswap you might have heard of surpassed coinbase so they're doing billions of dollars of transactions and if they're taking this clip and earning millions of dollars a day who's getting all this revenue well we've cut out the middleman we've cut out the building and all the overheads this is just now software and all that revenue goes to the token holders the governance token holders of those individual projects and who's using uniswap i mean who because to most people watching this, again, some people will know everything about all of this, and other people will be going, well, who the hell's, where's this volume coming from? Well, a lot of it is trading and speculating, for sure. Uh, but a lot of it is people saying, well, I'm going to go buy some land in Decentraland, so I need their mana token. Well, I want to go and buy some gold and silver tokens, and I'm going to trade that against Ethereum or a stable coin. Or I want to go and experiment on that other project over there, so I need their token. So it's just people that are trading different tokens. Another part of this that's got very, very interesting recently is Bitcoin. So Bitcoin being, we call it wrapped, and it basically turns Bitcoin into an Ethereum token. And that just recently has surpassed a billion dollars. Much like the US dollar is a, te you know, US, the stable coins are, are US dollars wrapped in, in Ethereum, right? Exactly. And there are, again, there are scales of this. So there are centralized companies that are basically storing your Bitcoin and giving you a, a wrapped Bitcoin. And there are decentralized companies that are doing the same thing, but with software. So instead of trusting a company, you're trusting the smart contract to lock up your Bitcoin and give you a, a wrapped Bitcoin, a digital Bitcoin. And so now you can say, well, what we are seeing is a lot of Bitcoin coming to get the yield. So rather than just hodling and waiting for it to go up over time, there's some very attractive yields now on Bitcoin. And so I just think this is giving it um, more and more value and utility. But as getting back to your first question, what we're now seeing is the yield curve. So the money markets are maturing. There are projects that are building out that, that yield curve and offering some stability because one day it'll be 10%, um, you know, APY, and the next day it'll drop to 5%. And people want certainty if they're going to lend and borrow money. So yes, the yield curve and the money markets are very much maturing. I was thinking this through and eventually, because of the nature of the asset of Bitcoin, most people will hold it for longer terms. So that's perfect as a collateral asset, particularly as its volatility goes down over age and size and everything else. So you've got this asset now, which is proven ownership. It's like pristine collateral, as I call it. It's mm. like you, you prove the ownership. It's immediately transferable. It's immediately ownable. It's not like a gold in somebody's warehouse that might have been rehypothecated. So it's verifiable and it's instantaneous. So if I'm going to give you any collateral because I want to borrow some money for, from you to do something, you're more likely, once the volatility has gone down over time in Bitcoin, to lend it to me for a premium, which is a weird world because we're used to pristine collateral the US treasuries, which aren't pristine, but they're the best we've got, 
trading at the lowest risk rates because it's weird because that collateral is actually riskier because there's more gets issued all the time. So there's no rarity in that. Yes, it has an income stream, but the income stream seems to go down over time because the yields go down. And the currency that it's in over time gets debased, whether it's in small fractions or in larger times, depending what's going on. Well, crypto, there can be no, with Bitcoin, there can be no new issuance. Nobody can debase it. Nobody can issue more of it. There's, there's nothing can happen to it. So it's pristine. It's like giving you a, you know, a Van Gogh and saying, well, okay, here's my collateral. I'm going to try and tie this all together in like 60 seconds on why I think things have really changed this year. Why are people buying stocks and still speculating? Because there's that that growth aspect to it, but there's also you know a, a decent yield on a lot of these, but they are relatively scarce. So even if Apple print 5% more shares, that's still not as bad as the Fed and the US government staring down the barrel of these three, $6 trillion deficits and having to, um, you know, add this the liquidity and print money and just inflate M2 by 10 or 20%. So if you just put aside all your preconceived notions of value and just say how scarce is one thing compared to another, we've got this food chain of people no longer really trusting the US dollar as much as they used to. And then, as you said, bonds, they're probably not going to be that scarce as they once were. Do we trust the US dollar as much as we used to? The yield on these are now, you know, it's a pittance. And then you say, well, shares, are they, is Apple going to print more shares? Is that more scarce than currency? I'm not sure. And then you go down into this is why gold is obviously so attractive in this environment. Even tokenizing digital gold, you can get a good yield on Ethereum now. But then you go down that food chain to, to Bitcoin and you say, well, hold on, this is like the most scarce asset. Um, I, I trust it. I, I know what it is compared to everything else out there. It is just way more scarce in terms of the tr trillions of dollars that's going to have to be monetized in one way or another, either through bond issuance or the Fed directly monetizing it or what, whatever it is. But now you can get a yield on that as well. Like this is really incredible. And in terms of Ethereum, which in my mind is the second blue chip cryptocurrency, we can get a pretty decent yield on, on the Ethereum token, more so on the stable coins and other elements of that space. But Ethereum is about to make that big move to um, proof of stake where you'll be able to lock up your coins and basically get a dividend, a yield, a reward. A proof of stake change is, is, again, further cementing a money market because you have to have the time value of money while it's locked up. Yeah, and we're already seeing like people, you know how we just spoke about wrapping up Bitcoin to put it on Ethereum. People are already wrapping up Ethereum to put it on these other chains because Ethereum's clogged now. And they're saying, you know, I, I'm not quite, I don't want to wait for that layer two uh, thing to be ready and production ready and trusted. Let's go use, um, I'm trying to think of, there's probably none that people are familiar with. But basically, yeah, you can wrap up Ethereum and put it on another cryptocurrency and send it to you. And then you unwrap it. And that's and, that saves paying fees. And a lot of people will say, well, bloody hell, there's all these tokens and who knows what anything's worth. I look at that and say, look how ingenious the space is. You see a problem, solution comes. Because all you're trying to do is clear all obstacles to get value from A to value to B and realize that value. And that people are clearing all the obstacles and making it worthwhile doing it as well. Yeah. No, I should preface it by saying, like I've always said from day one, that 99% of these are going to fail and they're junk and they're scams. But I just believe like... If you are betting against Ethereum, you are betting against like thousands, tens of thousands of the smartest people in the world trying to solve every problem from the gaming industry to the music industry to the finance industry to building a new internet. And, and these people are leaving Silicon Valley, they're leaving their banking jobs and they're coming to work and out of their own pocket sometimes for years. And now a lot of these guys are millionaires or billionaires and so they've got that capital behind them. They don't have to go and get on their knees and beg VCs to do this idea and the VCs say, well, just change this, that and the other and then we'll let you do it. This is like pure free market capitalism and it is no surprise that this stuff is growing. Like, as I said, the stablecoin market is testament to that thousand percent year on year growth and I think it's going to grow a thousand percent next year. I mean, what's interesting, as you say, you raise an interesting point, is the space is starting to self-fund itself, you know, because the people who made the OGs of Bitcoin originally created large businesses. Those businesses generate cash. They've got VC operations. So it's just money staying within the system. They don't even need all the other guys. Yes, so Andreessen Horowitz and a bunch of these guys have walked into the space seriously, but there's so much capital within the space. 
Absolutely. So there's a, a decentralized funding program called Gitcoin Grants. And literally a few hours ago, someone, they opened up the next round of grants. And our first grant was $1,000. And I can go hire a new junior researcher to, to help find the best Ethereum projects and do more research. And some for the first time ever, a project that has just absolutely boomed lately, um, they donated more to this pool of money than the Ethereum Foundation. So there are thousands of dollars that are getting given to all these grassroots projects directly from anywhere in the world. You don't even know who gave this to you a lot of the time. And this is the community. And a lot of this just happens on crypto Twitter. People will say, that is a fantastic idea. And the, the guy is a billionaire and he just sends you $10,000 to your Ethereum address and says, good stuff, keep up the good work. And it, like this is just an unbelievable space that this is happening. Um, it's, it's very self-reinforcing, you know. It's a really even, you know, I was talking about this with Santiago Velas about the tribalism in the space, which actually makes it stronger because it's like the clash of the tribes all the time. So everybody's kind of testing each other's protocols, you know. Is that one shit? Is this one shit? But what you're doing is eventually the tribes, you know, are gathering around a few places. Those have been really well tested now. And those guys are very protective of it. So it just makes yes it a no. very robust environment. Yes and no. I, I would agree in that in some ways. It's great. We need competition in that regard. But what's happened in Ethereum this year is the opposite. It's almost like every we call it the DeFi Legos because they all snap together. And people are saying, oh, wow, that lending app, oh, I can just snap that code into my gaming app and it works together because of the composability. And now we've got hundreds or thousands of projects on Ethereum that aren't tribal. They're the opposite. They're saying, hey, if we can all... No, I mean, I would mean tribal uh, Ethereum versus Bitcoin and stuff like yes, that. Yes, absolutely. But I think another important aspect I want people to understand is the fact that the, almost the opposite is happening on Ethereum where everyone sees each other as creating the, the network effects that... Um, you know, Metcalf's law, where if we have a thousand projects that are all very interesting and have different features and utilities and they're composable, we start to snap these together. And now there's a million possibilities. And that is what is happening at the moment. Um, I, I like insurance has recently popped up, for example, decentralized yeah, the, the insurance. Because you say, hey, I'm not going to I'm not going to put in a million dollars into that lending protocol. It's probably going to get hacked. Well, now you can insure that. So every problem that is coming up is being solved. And some of these are being solved within weeks or days. It's insane. So talk me through, and I got lost in some of this, yam, sushi, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a ton of this stuff going on. What are these all? Because everyone yeah. will see them on Twitter and nobody knows what they are. And before you know it, they've gone, they've gone under before you know it. Oh, uh, yeah. And look, I got uh, my fingers burnt a little bit the other day as well. So this is a high, high risk space. And if you're a beginner or even intermediate, you should not be dabbling in this space. So what's happened is... Um, the Uniswap example we gave before, the, the DEX, Decentralized Exchange, that was originally funded by some VCs. And you mentioned Andreessen Horowitz and some of these really good firms. So look, in my mind, those guys that were the early backers, they deserve good rewards. But one of the things that the ICO movement started was that decentralized funding, more of a level playing field than going to the VC market, you know, those different rounds and having to bend the knee and, and this, that and the other. But then it went too far and we saw all the scams and, and whatnot. So we're trying to make a, a fair way to raise money and have ownership over a project. That's the problem that we're trying to solve. And what people are now saying is, well, should those right, be people sell their tokens and then go away and don't do well, it? In a, in, a, in a scam example, yes. But in the other example is, well, should a VC get rich if it's the community that are the users and paying all these fees. And so what's happening now with all these sushis and yams and that, they're basically cloning the open source code. So they're just copying Uniswap and calling it SushiSwap. And they're saying, instead of the VCs making all the money from all the fees, here, for the first two weeks, everyone that uses our protocol, you're all going to get this governance token. You're going to get sushi tokens. And at the end of the two-week period, you're all going to own this protocol. And a billion dollars moved from Uniswap to sushi swap out of 1.4 billion dollars and now this gets to another question they call them liquidity locusts are they going to be loyal are they just going to go to the next one and the next one and that's what we're kind of waiting to see but the, the, what they're trying to do is give ownership to the community rather than the vc so even though these vcs are, are good people i would say in uniswap's um case and hayden adams the guy behind that worked very hard for many years 
So it becomes an ethical question, well, should those guys get the rewards or should the community be the owners of all these different protocols and should they split the rewards and get all the dividends and remove the VCs? Sounds like robbery to me. It is an ethical question. It is an ethical question. Who should get all the profit? Because if you build Uniswap and you've had to get in, you build Alex project. Yes. Alex swap. You have put your blood, sweat and tears. You've gone round on bended knee to all the VCs who've listened to your thing, put their risk capital in so you could build your business. And the next day I come along and say, ah, oh, it's, uh, it's not Alex swap any longer. It's Raoul swap. I'm doing it over here. Same terms, I'm going to give you some free tokens. Yes. That's but, but, then, but then the next day someone else comes along and makes real vision swap. And so you say, well, where is the loyalty? What do people want? It's whoever delivers the best user experience and the lowest fees to a point where they can uh, still okay. make money. So maybe, it's, all, it's an equal Maybe it's just perfect competition. And what we haven't done is erode the super normal profits yet. So when the profits collapse or the yields collapse to same as money market rates in the US or whatever, that's the end of that game. So everybody's- Or people, to people say, well, why would I do anything if I don't have a moat? And then this is like, we're trying to find out what the happy medium is because we don't know. And if people are gonna keep all these projects open source, then anyone can come along and copycat those. And you know, there's something also inherently good about lots of failure because the space is super enabled to test ideas and if it fails people just kind of laugh it off i mean yes as long as you're not you know putting all your belief in in the the new new thing you know you you see arthur hayes and people like that go oh christ you know that one went to zero okay yeah. um but what they're enjoying is actually the testing of ideas and yeah. seeing boundaries, but getting you know pushed, pushed further out all the time, and yeah. Yeah, that's what I think is amazing. And, and a good example, really this, tolerant of it. The other day, the sushi swap one, and the one I was saying that I got burnt a little bit on, where the lead developer basically sold a lot of his tokens at once, like dumped ten million dollars of tokens, and so he's kind of lost the trust of the community. And again, that is a learning lesson where the next iteration of a different project or the same idea, whatever it is, they will say, well, we need to time lock the the contract for the tokens of the developers and everything every failure will improve upon and that's where i really think that i, I don't like the over regulation that happened after the ico boom i think people have learned their lesson and people aren't going to throw money at stupid things again and they're going to be more cognizant of scams if you had have kept that completely free market i would have thought that people would learn from it and that people teach their friends about well don't do this down the other and be careful of scams and i think we're going to find a happy medium of, well, how do you protect people versus, you know, how do you just allow pure innovation to spread and everyone to try every idea? Whereas have we overregulated? I think in some countries we have, in others we haven't. So do you think that as more and more money piles into the DeFi space in, in search of yield, that yields are just going to converge to standard Fed yields? They will always be slightly higher. I see them maybe settling around. If we if we get into a couple of trillion dollar market cap, which I think we're going to in the next few years, I still think you'd probably get natural rates of growth that we saw like pre two thousands, five percent ish. Call it. Well, um, it's kind of yeah. probably more like a junk bond market. And by the time you hedge that risk, which is the Nexus Mutual thing, which is the insurance, it's like buying CDS on your junk bond, and so the your final yield might be. Three percent, and and at the moment, some of these things that are offering like crazy high yields, the the yield number that you're seeing on the screen when something says it's a thousand percent yield, that's because you you're getting that governance token, and the market is paying a huge premium for that. Everyone wants to own these new projects and get in early, and so when you see oh it's a thousand percent yield, it's not really like they're paying you out a thousand percent in stable coins. It's you're getting this governance token, which is worth a fortune at the moment. So in the old world, you're getting bonds plus shares. So yeah, you, you kind of get yeah dividend plus warrants. You know, it's kind of you see that that kind of structure quite a lot. So you get a bit of upside in the in the thing if it takes off, but you get a yield as well. And that's I mean that's, that's pretty attractive. But still, I mean those rates are still pretty high. Yes, and um, I, I just think that the it's water always finds its level. And 
if you've got negative interest rates in the real world, even if they're going to bring in these digital dollars, and I'm not sure if you want to talk about the central bank coins and the government coins and whatnot. Yeah, talk are, about are it. They, are they going to program in negative interest rates onto these digital currencies to penalise people? And then do you say, well, hold on, why don't I go to a tether? And they can't program a negative interest well, rate. Well, I mean, look, the logical conclusion that we've reached, we are pretty much at the end of the ability to use monetary policy as a driver of economic policy. Sure, there's some stuff we can do, but we know that most of it is now effective. So the law of diminishing returns is set in. That's one of the key reasons. There's a bunch of other reasons why the central banks want to use digital currencies. What I'm interested in, in this whole space, is the ability to completely reinvent monetary policy and fiscal policy at the same time as part of the same thing. Because I can give you, I can give Alex $1,000 and a 10% yield because you're young and you're an entrepreneur and I want to make sure you're supported. And I can give the baby boomer 10% yield and you know, a different yield and a different thing. I can... Um, Offset your tax credits, all your tax can be charged out of it, so it's net of taxes. I mean, everything can become a lot simpler. Now, a lot of people don't like it because the heavy hand of the state. Well, get over it. You've got roads, you've got cars, you've got hospitals. Part of it is the state. If you want to get over it, do what I do. I live in the Cayman Islands. Or, or as you said, digitally, you probably can get out of it. But you're going to be breaking the law at some point because at some point you have to cross this tax system. And you have the freedom to choose to move. And if you don't like your government regime go somewhere else. And that's okay. Um, and same with, we'll, we'll come to the currency side, but I'm just, I just so, think we're going to reinvent what monetary and fiscal policy is. Yeah. Because I can do it to different people precisely and exactly. I can have a different tax rate for you because you, I think, are going to be great risk capital for the future of my country. And those guys differently, I I can do anything down to the individual. Yeah, and if you think about like the macro, which I, you know, I've learned so much from you guys over the years and and other smart people out there, and you talk about the debt, demographics, and deflation. Well, I'd add two more Ds. So I think everything digital and technology is deflationary, and I think we're really going to have to have conversations about overpopulation if we keep growing, and there's not going to be as many jobs as the what software is going to do. And then you've also got de danger. So whether it's COVID or civil unrest in these cities and these highly populated areas, what happens if we do Which go is, through a recession? Is that not a function of po that's a function of population as well? I guess. I think it's population in the CBDs. So, like, uh, why are people going to live in these concrete jungles where there's if we're in this recession with no jobs and it's more expensive to live there and there's no fresh water, um, food, clean air? I think we're really going to see the way that we live our lives change because of digital AR, VR, working from home. So that's the kind of things that I think we're facing. So you say, well, how are we going to pay off everything that we've borrowed from the future, this $26 trillion in the US or $100 trillion unfunded liabilities? That has to be monetized either by the sale of the bonds, the printing of US dollars or defaults or whatever it is. So that is kind of like the situation that we are staring at in terms of the traditional world. And then you've got this other world, which is like natural growth. Everything is collateralized. There's no debts. You know, the, every, as you said, it's almost like the perfect, um, the perfect collateral, the hardest collateral, whether it's Bitcoin or Ether or some of these other gold back tokens. I think that world is where people are going to want to be. Uh, and, and that's where I, I just think that um, that's where monetary policy is facing so many challenges because you say, well, how do we print money if people know that they can park in a scarce asset? How do we deploy negative interest rates if people know that they can go and park in Tether or gold or Bitcoin? Um, you know, how do you stop that? And so more and more people are going to opt out of that traditional finance system and opt for this, this newer system. The genie's out of the bottle. And that's, that's the problem. I, I said that when Facebook talks about Libra, it's like, okay, the genie's out of the bottle. You can try and stamp down Facebook, but a basket of global currencies is coming, and it may or may and, and it may not be and it may not be denominated in dollars. It might be, you know, it may be just a basket of currencies with dollars, and that becomes a whole stable currency for the whole world. That's a zero vol currency. You know, the thing that I think that everyone is still missing with this conversation around stable coins is Chinese government want to launch this digital yuan. 
Yeah. Then you've got Jamie Dimon that wants to launch JP Coin and Zuckerberg that wants to launch um, Libra. So you've got the corporate world, private world, and then you've got um, the central banks that want to launch Fedcoin. So that's actually those three that are in the battle that all want to stay relevant. And and then we have the Bitcoin crypto world, which is the fourth option as well. So when people say, well, they won't let this happen, if if the Fed launch Fedcoin and everyone can have Fed app and have a direct ledger and transfer money to them, you almost make the commercial banking system irrelevant. That is really going to upset Jamie Dimon. But yeah. then the Chinese government aren't going to like that either because the government want to have control over all their citizens and they want the world to use um, the digital yuan, which is a government-issued coin. And so you're going to have this battle between the commercial banking system, the central banking system and governments, and then the crypto world. And you've also got rid of the need for SWIFT. So the problem the Chinese have is the Americans can block the flow of capital. Well, that's gone overnight. Mm. So the Americans don't get the exorbitant privilege of having a reserve currency by owning the payment system. And if we want to talk about the like the euro dollar system, and this is something that Brent and I spoke about the other day, and I think even you've changed your opinion on this a little bit. It's like I've started to think about the dollars outside of the US, the euro dollars, as almost a separate currency to the domestic dollar. And it's kind of unregulated when you compare it to the rest of the global currencies, and yet it's still the Fed's problem. So the Fed have got this big problem that they're trying to fix here, but then there's this 10 or $20 trillion problem here. And when they say, oh, we're going to print a trillion dollars and people go, oh, that's so much. Well, it's not really because there's this huge demand for dollars to pay down all these external debts as well as their internal problems. But now you've got this new payment rails with my, like, you know, I joke about it and call it the thick shake theory because it makes the old system look like everyone's trying to suck thick shakes through straws compared to everyone with a digital rail and smartphone in their hand moving all these dollars around the world instantly. So that's where I think they're going to face a huge problem. And I don't think it's even that much of a privilege anymore. Like I think that's where I kind of changed my mind a little bit, that it's almost becoming um, a bit of a burden on the US to have this other external problem to try it and solve. It is a burden, but the burden still remains on the debtors more. So the mm. debtors, it, it's a real problem. It would normally function if the European and the Japanese banking systems functioned. But that changed, right? The regulation changed, Basel III and a bunch of other stuff, and just how bad their banking systems have become, the kind of rotting carcass that's left. So you took out the velocity part of the equation. So they would have direct access to the Fed. In the old days, Deutsche Bank US, fungible with Deutsche Bank Germany, lent to everybody. Okay, endless supply of capital, flows around the world, no problem. The rules change. That office is not fungible with that office. And um, and these guys in Germany now don't have enough. So they're playing musical chairs with all of the people who've borrowed it. And the Japanese are doing the same and every bank's doing the same. So bear with me here. Can we solve this problem with our new digital payment rails? So tying together everything we've spoken about today, if you're in Russia or China and you don't have a SWIFT system or they're blocking you or you don't have a swap line, the Fed aren't giving you that that privilege. What if you now tokenize your house? Vladimir Putin tokenizes his house and he goes to the Ethereum protocol and he can now um, mint stable coins against that as his collateral or his Bitcoins as collateral or all his, all his gaming swords that he's been playing games in Decentraland. The problem, it, yes, I mean, you can, but when you're dealing with governments, you're dealing with military as well. It's, you know, collateral is not as meaningful. Yes, Bitcoin is possible, but the problem is, is that the Russian state is... So where I'm going with this is sort of not to do with the governments, though. If Vladimir issues and mints all his own stable coins to himself, so the Ethereum protocols, the software... All these different apps will let you borrow against whatever collateral as long as it's digital. So, so everyone around the world in these different countries mints their own USD stable coins. And there's an unlimited supply of these. You can mint them as long as they have collateral. And now these digital stable coins can go down to pay these US dollar debts. And some somewhere, they if they go back to the Coinbase or the USDCs or the Tethers, they have to be paid. And this is where you get into this food chain problem of where does that money come from? And if it's Coinbase that have JP Morgan doing their retail banking and JP Morgan have got the Fed behind them saying, hey, we've got more demand for these dollars coming in because they've got all these reserves and they, they're happy to lend them out if there's demand and, and projects. This is well, the food chain that stable coins are going well, 
the issue is here, and you're right, but it's not. I don't think the architecture of the system's there yet, because the problem is is the debt. So I'm South Korean car company, and I've borrowed in dollars, and I've borrowed from the Bank of Alex, and I now need to roll my debt. The Bank of Alex is like. Yeah, everyone's asked me to roll my debts. I don't really have the cap capital. I've been regulated, right? It's now it's not it's not a matter of money, me giving you liquidity. You're like, I can't do it. So and how do I get that? Right now, the tether system, which could work, because you could hack basically the Fed direct to the South Korean corporate, right? Which is what we're talking about. Because right now you have to go swap line to banking system to corporate. And bits of that are broken. So let's say you go. Let's say you go um, stablecoin from U.S. bank branch, stablecoin South Korean corporate. They're not after the cash to pay the loan; they're after the loan. So we need to have a money market that's three years, five years. We don't have any of that yet. We're still fighting over world of kind of what one month money's worth in this. So yes, I mean it changes again. It's the same example as the central bank digital. Coins because everybody can pay anybody directly, and it's the same yeah. with that. So they can I add see. liquidity, and it becomes it is a problem for them because why do they care about the bloody South Korean? If you if you think about it as just this super fluid system with money, digital dollars and digital yuans or whatever it is floating around the world on the Ethereum rails, as soon as you've got collateral and you can mint stable coins, and then you can go to an exchange and sell those for actual US dollars at one to one then you can pay down these US denominated debts. And that's the sort of the thing that I keep. Like. No, because I'm the borrower, right? So I've borrowed for my car factory, you know, $100 million. I've given you the collateral already. So the, the collateral is already there. The problem is, is I need to either borrow more or I need more money to service my debts. Oh, you're talking about servicing your debts, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm kind of coming at it at a different angle, more about how do we address the shortage of supply of US dollars that's been constrained by the banking system, whereas I think you're kind of talking about more it's like solvency problems and economy slowing down and how to actually pay down the, the debts that they've, they've taken on. Yeah, because the banks – see, I – yeah, I mean, there are two problems. Yeah. There are two problems. And, and I just love thinking about this stuff. I, I just think that it's it's, it's going to play a very, very important role that central banks, governments, and retail banks aren't really considering at the moment. These rails are going to be able to address some They're, of these issues. Most of these guys are very, very far behind where this space is going. And, you know, this space has always attracted, well, that's a scam. That's ridiculous. But what they don't understand is these things are being tested by the free market, yeah. A lot of very, very smart people. And everybody's kind of doing minimum viable product, iterate, improve, see how that works, move on. And at the epicenter of it all is this kind of holy grail of perfection, which is Bitcoin, which acts as the like the solidifier for the whole space for people to know, yes, we can build from here. And this is, you know, it's extraordinary what's going on. And, and you know, to go back to the beginning of the whole idea of the 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 uh, series we're doing right now is has everything changed and it's clear from our conversation that even in the last six months pretty much everything's changed yeah i think once you get rid of all your preconceived notions and say that everything currency is going digital whether it's corporate coins government coins or central bank coins once it's digital and they have a supply and a value and you compare the one that's printing trillions and the one that's that's scarce it's very obvious where you park your money to store your wealth um well, yeah you, you agree with that and the thing that i think takes us to a hundred thousand dollar bitcoin is that the smartest people i know the brett johnson's of the world lynn oldens you know yourself these people weren't really around and advocating in 2017 when we had that sort of retail boom and i think we've got some very very intelligent people that understand all the different aspects because bitcoin is so multifaceted to some people it's a payment system to some people it's a store of value to some people it's actually a the hardest computing network and most secure and we've got microsoft piggybacking off that so that has value in and of itself so bitcoin is so many things to so many different people and the smartest people in their fields are saying bitcoin super bullish and when all the smartest people are saying that it's no longer youtubers or retail speculators it's 
people that are followed by high net worth individuals and sovereigns. MicroStrategy last night came out and said we've bought another 125 um, 175 million dollars. I'm speaking to Michael. I'm speaking to Michael tomorrow, so it'll have been out by the time this is out. I think it's going to be. So, so, so who needs e e CEO. ETFs if every company on their balance sheet is just hoarding Bitcoin? Like th this is incredibly bullish. And I always said no one wants to be first, and then no one wants to be last. And it is a matter of time until the first sovereign, who, like even some of the governments now, are beginning to talk about hoarding gold. Why wouldn't you, when you've got your printer going brrr out of thin air? Buy as much Bitcoin as you can before other people notice. It might already be happening. I'm sure it uh, is. I'm and sure that's where I think when people say everything's changed, I don't think China are going to be able to buy up commodities off Australia or the US by money printing go burr. And we're already seeing hoarding of commodities in the news. People are going to start to say, what is anything worth when everything is just backed by nothing in the fiat world? Am I going to keep giving all my oil or my food or my land to money printer go burr in this different country? Well, there you go. Perfect. Alex, that was a really, really great conversation. Loved it. I think there's a lot for people to digest in this, a lot for me to digest as well. So appreciate getting you on. And you've got a fantastic piece coming out, um, you know, a whole piece about the whole ecosystem of Ethereum on Real Vision. Uh, I'm not sure when it comes out, but it'll be out on the crypto channel. So it's super exciting. Yeah, appreciate everything you guys do. And um, thanks for having me on, Raul. Yeah, cheers. Perfect. If you like what you see on our YouTube channel, you can unlock everything that Real Vision has to offer from expert analysis, in-depth reports, education, and more to help you understand finance, business, and the global economy. You can get all that and more for just $1 for 30 days.